And so at this time, we're going to hear from Matt, and he's going to give us our opening uh, words. Take it away, Matt. Good morning, everybody. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> and so I want to, I want to, you know, lift that up a little bit because the history is so important, you know, give us uh, a moment here, you know, even just use the chat and just shout out names. Um, that would be well. Just a reminder for everybody to mute themselves uh, if you're not talking. Uh, yeah, just shout out names in the chat or organizations that have um, carried forward, NAACP, um, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, Student for Democratic Society, SDS, you know, just um, people that James Lawson, just people that are continuing to carry work forward, even in their later years, Vincent Harding, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, go ahead, shout out names, so just recognize the history, where we've come from, but also where we're going. Black history is not about where we've been, but it's about where we're going. So this is Black Futures Month. We just uh, ground ourselves in where we've been. So I want all of us to take that lesson to recognize where we've been so we know where we're going. Uh, we rec recognize the Harriet Tubman's that gave us the roots of abolition. The ability, it's, it's not the elimination of something, but the ability to imagine something new. And that's what we're here doing. We're imagining something new. That's what Black History Month is about. It's like, hey, recognize the past so you can imagine a new world. And so uh, that's what we're here doing. I want to also take the time, I'm a part of something called the Poor People's Campaign. This is not a pitch for them, but it's a part of that legacy of looking in the past and carrying something forward. You know, looking up to elders like William Barber, who started, uh, reignited Martin Luther King's vision of the Poor People's Campaign. A year before King was assassinated, he started something called the Poor People's Campaign in 1967. And just before, uh, he was actually playing a March on Washington, um, but he was assassinated. It actually still continued a moral March on Washington to address poverty um, for poor, poor and low wealth people. William Barber has continued that work forward as imagining a new world, imagining a better world, imagining a beloved community in this world. And so William Barber and Liz Theo Harris um, are carrying the Poor People's Campaign um, forward, carrying Martin Luther King's vision forward. You know, King said he was at the mountaintop and he, he saw it, you know, and so we can also be there. We can also be there and imagine that new world. We can get to that place and see that this is the community that like we, we, we can see the beloved community. We can and then, you know, just get that get that uh, Gandhi quote in, the, in our heads, you know, be that changed that we want to see, you know, and so. Uh, we, we just, we got to be that people. And so this month really grounds us and gives us the ability to do that. So um, take a moment in the chat and just um, shout out organizations locally, um, if you can, that are just doing really powerful things because there's beautiful, beautiful things. I'm not sure if you, um, on Thursday, we had, uh, took, a t took some time out to watch the presentation that Healing Justice put on, um, a couple, uh, two sessions of interviews of panelists and a video presentation of Black history in Santa Barbara. So just root yourselves in the history because the history will show you where you are going and it allows us to imagine the world. And so use that because that is, that is what it means to be a part of the kingdom. That is what it means to be the beloved community, to be a child of God, to, to go in and walk in the light. So go be light walkers today um imagine a more new and beautiful world thank you mr load mr changemaker let us uh listen to a little music uh, the first part is uh, by <clears throat> DGLS, uh, which is the uh, the consonants from Douglas, the Douglas family. These are four kids that are siblings, and they took those consonants and decided to call themselves DGLS or Do Good, Love Somebody. Ooh, hey, yo. Mm -hmm. Ooh, hey, yo. Mm -hmm. I've been walking mm -hmm. 
way If my face turned mm-hmm. to go to prepare a place and this is how we do it steal away steal away steal away to jesus steal away steal away home i ain't got long to stay here My Lord, he calls me, he calls me by the thunder, a trumpet sounds within my soul, I ain't got long to stay here, steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus, steal away, steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. Green trees are bending, poor sinners stand the trembling. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal away, steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. Trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. 
Cheryl, would you please lead us in prayer? May we quiet ourselves as we pray. God of history, today and the future, we come this Sunday in February to remember the Black men and women over the years who have impacted our country. You, O oh God, in your wisdom, created each human uniquely with gifts, talents, skills, and personalities. We are so thankful for the Black storytellers, poets, novelists, playwrights. We give thanks for Black creative spirits found in art, photography, music, dance, acting, and science. We are filled with gratitude for those courageous, insightful, strong, articulate Black humans who led the way in being first in a field, a Supreme Court justice, a congresswoman, a millionaire entrepreneur, a NASA scientist, a doctor renowned in blood transfusion and blood storage knowledge, a US Army general, a US president, a US vice president. The list of amazing black individuals is unending. A number of names come to mind, Robert Abbott, Alvin Ali, Muhammad Ali, Richard Allen, Maya Angelou, Ella Baker, James Baldwin, Mary McLeod Bethune, Shirley Chisholm, Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr., Frederick Douglass, Dr. Charles Drew, Duke Ellington, Aretha Franklin, Jimi Hendrix, Jesse Jackson, Katherine Johnson, Martin Luther King Jr., Henrietta Lacks, John Lewis, Malcolm X, Thurgood Marshall, Toni Morrison, Jesse Owens, Gordon Parks, Sidney Portier, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Madam C.J. Walker, Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Wells. We give thanks for all these named persons and the so many not named and those individuals whose names have been lost over the years. May we realize that black history is all our history and that there is no American history without the contributions of African-Americans, those who were stolen from their homelands, trafficked and enslaved, and those who chose to come here. We pray that the stories of black humans are taught in all educational institutions so that one day there will be no need for Black History Month because every month, every day, we will learn about black individual stories. We pray, holy God, the God of all people, that humanity will make different choices. And as a result, prison systems will be redemptive. Police will treat people fairly with no regard to skin color, where all schools are well-funded. All will have food and housing. May those who are fearful of such choices recognize that these choices are grace-filled. May all hearts be willing to recognize the pain that has been caused, seek forgiveness and right the wrongs. May the world's vision be widened to see humanity in all people. In the name of Jesus, who loved and accepted everyone. Amen. And now to Jade for the community reading. That was beautiful. What a lovely prayer. Gosh, that really got to me. Let me uh, compose myself here a little bit. That was beautiful. Um, good morning, beloved community. Feel free to unmute uh, when it's your turn to speak. Father, Mother, God, thank you for your presence during the hard and mean days, for then we have you to lean upon. Thank you, thank you for your presence, presence during the bright and sunny days, days. for then we can, can share that which we have, have with, those with those who have less. less. And thank you for your presence during these, our holy days, for then we are able to celebrate you and our families and our friends. Thank you for your presence. 
during the bright and sunny, and sunny days, for then, for then we can, we share, can share that which, that we, which have. we have with those, those who, who have, have less. less. And thank you for your presence during our holy days, for then we are able to celebrate you and our families and our friends. For those who have, no, who voice, have no voice, we ask, we ask you, to, you speak. to speak. For those who feel unworthy, we ask you to pour your love out in waterfalls of tenderness. For those who live in pain, live in pain we ask you we to ask bathe, you them bathe them in the river, in the river of, your of your healing. For, For those, those who are lonely, who are lonely we ask you we to, ask you to keep, keep them, them company. company. For those who are depressed, we ask you to shower upon them the light of hope. Dear Creator, we ask you to give, you to give to all the world to which we need most. Peace. Peace. Amen. Amen. And for announcements, I give you always gregarious Clint Allen. Thank you, Jade. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the beloved community. It's Sunday, February 20th, 2022. And today's theme, Invitation to Black History. Thursday night, Jacob wants to see you. I want to see you. Julia wants to see you. We all want to see you. Thursday night, we missed it because we didn't have it this week, but Healing Justice was a big deal, and we understand that. But this Thursday, we'll see you. Black History Month. Put it in the chat. What have you read that was important to you? What movie or documentary? I, You know what? Uh, 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 Muhammad Ali, The Greatest. I love that book. All right. We are live streaming privately to New Covenant Living on Facebook. We will later break up into small groups for a three-minute three meet and greet. <laughs> Do you know someone? Or are you the someone? We really need tech help in order to continue our online presence when we next meet in person. We will conclude with communion this morning. Use whatever you have on hand to take us bread and wine. They are welcome. People are thinking about your beloved community. Go ahead and invite them. Please consider giving electronically or mail to New Covenant Worship Center, P.O. Box 1661, Santa Barbara, California, 93116. Julia will be putting some links in the chat. If you'd like to uh, follow those, you can go ahead and uh, contribute that way. Stay tuned for an update from Jacob Lesnar Buxton about upcoming Thursday nights. The history of capitalist era is characterized by the degradation of my people. By, hold on one second, the chat just covered it up. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> by Paul Robertson? Hold on one second, it's gonna, oh, Paul Robertson, 1898 to 1976. All right, and I believe now we're gonna to go to the three minute meet and greet. Well, first Jacob. Oh, first Jacob. Thank you. I just want to remind, uh, remind everyone with church day night. We have a different topic every week. Um, Putting the next free topic in the Zoom chat box, and we meet at seven, and it's great. Also, if you have a good um, topic to talk about or speak out to reach out to, just email me. I'll put 
my email in the chat and come every so day and seven is great and especially if you can only make one in the next couple weeks, couple in March tests will have a group of home use of group use activities who are home use and said to Bobo who are activists speaking so it should be really powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. And now everybody take a moment to uh, make somebody feel welcome. Welcome back, everybody, and I'm so glad that we are all here. Um, just take about a, a 10 second break to check in with yourself and breathe.
Well, I'm going to read uh, this brief passage of scripture. By your focus here. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha, or some say Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. I'm going to come back to that um, in just a little while. We all recognize that families have secrets. And after we might learn of our family's secrets, many of us will join in concealing our family's history because of shame. We guard ourselves against shame by continuing the secrets. Well, the United States of America has a secret or two. The US is guarding itself against shame so that the society can feel good about itself. There's an immeasurable difference though between feeling good and being well, being healthy. You know, think about how sugar can make you feel good or excessive alcohol. We can feel good while we're getting sicker. Discovering black history can be painful. It's hard for me sometimes. Sometimes I'd rather read a novel or watch a stand-up comedian. Maybe watching a basketball game would be better than watching a documentary by Alex Haley or a Ava DuVernay or even a Spike Lee joint. I have so much respect when white folks uh, like Matt Lowe become black history researchers. We need a consciousness of history so that we don't comfortably rely on myths disconnected from reality. Consciousness, connecting with reality, is how we experience the beginning of well being. So we do the whole country a favor when we pause to recognize Black history because Black history is the history of enslavers. There would not have been enslavement on these shores without white people. You just saw a picture. Um, I'm going to show it again. Uh, let's see here. This, if I can get it up. Okay. I've done it before. I know I can do it again. <laughs> Maybe. What did I do wrong? Okay, so a moment ago, you saw a picture of my brilliant and talented niece, Olivia, who graduated from Pepperdine University last summer. She impressed me so much as a little girl that I have never called her Olivia her whole life. I insert an H after the O. I call her oh, Olivia. Well, a few days ago, Olivia raised a question. Now, her mother is Black and her father is white. So a lot of her way of being is informed by that. She asked, when talking about US enslavement, why do black people use pronouns like we and us? And, and that applies whether their ancestors were enslaved or not because not all um, black people were enslaved, uh, especially some of those in, in the North. 
She asks, why do black people use pronouns like we and us, but white people use they, them? She thinks it suggests a denial of history and a distancing, whether conscious or unconscious. Knowing our roots is therapeutic for all of us, and it's regenerative for human relations. So that's an important question Olivia raised. Everybody knows how easily Black people mostly have a collective identity. In fact, sometimes we call each other sister, brother, or just bruh. We might argue and fight, but we are very aware that we share a story, even if we don't always know the characters in our story. One CNN commentator said, Black people can sit together on the back of the Democrat bus or get run over by the Republican bus. What matters, my friends, is that we stand together in a society that doesn't know our story because the society doesn't know its own story. Our shared Black experience is where we most fundamentally experience Black joy and I often say that you can't experience black joy until you enter into black pain. Well, Olivia's sister Anita weighed in and said, enslavers did a lot to dissolve individual identity, but they gave up awareness of themselves and the land, which also may explain why the descendants of Africa and indigenous people tend to be more conscious of ancestors and Roots. It seems African and indigenous people tend to be mindful of the empowerment of our ancestors, our predecessors. I'd like to call your attention to just one example of how we hide history, how we delete history. So let's break this down. In 1968, at the Olympic Games in Mexico, um, this became iconic in ensuing years. Um, John Carlos was the silver medalist with his left hand raised there. John's memoir is one of the most informative histories of the 1960s that I have read. These two men, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, exposed their country's family secrets on the world platform. And I will say that if you, if you expose the country's family secrets, it could cost you too. Well, some years ago, I invited John Carlos to be a guest at our church. Um, and at that time, some of you know, I also led a church in Oxnard. And so uh, he, came, he came to both churches and there's Diane and me with him. Um, one of the things that I discovered is that the younger people, and you know, in Oxnard, that they were mostly black and brown kids, the, the young people didn't know this story. They didn't know anything about it. Now just consider that for a moment. About seven years ago, I attended a Black Lives Matter meeting in Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri, and I referenced the story of the 1968 Olympics, and none of these, mostly college students, knew about it. I asked them how they might feel if when they are my age, their kids don't know what happened in Ferguson. It gave us pause that day. There was a palpable sense of wonder. The summer that those two men, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, raised their fists in Mexico City, I was about to enter the ninth grade. But there's so very much I didn't know about those games. Not covered on the news, not in history books. One thing I didn't know was that Black athletes had planned to boycott the games. The effort collapsed after earlier in that year, April of 68, Dr. King was assassinated. John's book uh, says it this way, Dr. King felt the boycott was a very worthy project and could prove to be a mighty platform to make clear 
the need to establish justice and equality for all men and women on this planet. He said that our strongest leverage was that an Olympic boycott could have global reach. We could shock the world and we could do it by also adhering to the principles of nonviolence that he held so dear. We wanted to know, why are you going back to Memphis when they are threatening your life? Remember, Dr. King had been back and forth to Memphis where he was supporting a sanitation strike that had gotten so violent, it became an article of faith that Dr. King had been marked for death. We all knew it. We knew that if someone had a clear shot at this great man, the trigger would be squeezed. He was addressing not just racism at home, but also standing up against the war in Vietnam. He was just becoming too dangerous to too many people. At that moment, Dr. King made a very positive statement directly to me. He said, John, I have to go back and stand for those who won't stand for themselves, and I have to go back for those who can't stand for themselves. Um, there's so much I didn't know about all of this. After their protest, the president of the IOC immediately expelled John Carlos and Tommy Smith from the Olympic Village. The president of the International Olympic Committee was Avery Brundage, a Nazi sympathizer. Another thing I didn't know is during those Olympic games, there were other protests like Wyoming Atias. I didn't find out about this until I was well into adulthood. She was the first athlete, male or female, to win back-to-back 100-meter -back gold medals. And while the U.S. team's uniform had white shorts, she broke the rules and wore black shorts during her, her competitions in 68. And before each race, she would dance to a song called Tighten Up. And if you're not familiar with Tighten Up, you know, find it on YouTube. It exudes the R&B spirit of the 60s, the kind of music that I dance to kind of music I danced to on Soul Train. I don't know if you knew that, but I was a member of the original Soul Train gang. What I also didn't know for some time was that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar boycotted the game. He did boycott the games that year, and he would have been the best player on the team. Still, they won the gold medal. John Carlos and Tommy Smith they face tremendous blowback. John says it this way, we were facing a world of hurt back home. The Los Angeles Times said we had engaged in a Nazi-like salute. Time referenced our ugly gesture on its front cover. The worst was Brent Musburger. I don't know if anybody know, recognize that name, maybe if you're older, you, you do, but he's like, if you could, combine Bob Costas, Hannah Storm, and Keith Olbermann in terms of his prominence in the world of sports. He called us black-skinned stormtroopers. As a reward for doing that, the powers that be rocketed him up the ladder to serious fame. Musburger said, one gets a little tired of having the United States run down by athletes who are enjoying themselves at the expense of their country, protesting and working constructively against racism in the United States is one thing, but airing one's dirty clothing before the entire world during a fun and games tournament was no more than a juvenile gesture by a couple of athletes who should have known better. He then described Smith and Carlos as a pair of black skinned stormtroopers. The remarks from Musburger, who was soon catapulted to national network fame, scarred and infuriated Carlos, and they do to this day. But John said the most painful fart part for him was when George Foreman won the gold medal in boxing and Foreman ran around the ring holding a tiny American flag, hoping to distance himself from John Carlos and Tommy Smith. 
Well, both of those men fell into poverty. Nobody would hire them. Pro football teams would often and still do recru recruit world-class sprinters to be wide receivers. But the NFL treated these men like they treated brother Colin Kaepernick. And the United States treated them far worse than Kaepernick. The country has been lying to itself from the very start. We have to ask ourselves whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We have been lied to and we are complicit in spreading the lies. The American dream is tainted with illusion. It always has been. It's an illusion even for those who make the big time, those who become rich and famous, because all of that comes with a bitter aftertaste. It's mythology and we can be so much better. Our story is tainted and those of us who are baby boomers found out the hard way, which is why so many of those who are younger than us are taking different approaches. In fact, they're being forced to do things differently in some cases. We are here trying to break the spell of mythology, to break it with altruism and generosity and kindness and yet with boldness. In a way, we, those of us here and in many places, we create microcosms of the world we long for by remembering and loving the people around us and the ones who went before us. And so I beg you, please love people. Our practice of love resists and overcomes the zero-sum thinking that is so prevalent in our society. The story of Africans in America is just one of the many portals into reality, out of mythology. We need a consciousness of historical reality. Just, just ask yourself, what would a colonizer history month look like? Because white America needs healing. Sure, black indigenous, indigenous people and other people of color need healing too, but we know we need healing. Only when we embrace our histories and face our family secrets can we move forward towards reconciliation. You hear a lot of talk about reconciliation. But white folks are gonna to have to get reconciled to their own story. I opened today by reading this, an excerpt from the story of Elisha. He says, to this man, don't be afraid. There are more on our side than on theirs. And then Elisha prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. This is my prayer. Open their eyes and let them see. When our eyes are open, we'll complain less about first world, first world problems. And we'll stop being so fearful about social political conditions, so ready to give up. Because when our eyes are open, we will see the possibilities. We will, we will have a confident expectation of the possibilities. Some people are thinking that it's over for the United States. Well, I will say the empire might not come back, but the communities, the society have, have so much possibility. We can be so much better. So we can go on with our head in the clouds or we can shed the fear of uncovering the family secrets, face up to them and then move on. The movement for black lives has sought to change it from just being Black History Month to also being Black Futures Month, Black History and Futures Month. Black Futures Month is a visionary forward-looking spin on celebrations of Blackness in February. The movement for Black Lives is using this time to consider and celebrate our radical Black history and to dream and imagine a world in which we are all free and self-determined and to map and illustrate 
a world in which all Black lives matter. Dear God, I, I turn my heart to you with my brothers and sisters here today. I open my heart to you and to them. And I pray that you would open our eyes wherever we cannot see, that there are more with us than with the opposition, that there's more going. We have more going for us than we understand, but we're going to need to face up to our history. I recognize that it's really hard for some people. They don't want to sit down and and watch a painful documentary to watch a story like that or to read black history, black thought, because it exposes shame. But only when we can embrace our secrets can we overcome that shame. And so I pray that at least for us in this household, those of us on this call right now, that we would by your spirit derive new empowerment, new strength to face our own family story, to draw on the glory that is interspersed throughout the history, but never forget that we have to deal with the hard stuff. Amen. Amen. How are we doing, my friends? Pastor, um, <clears throat> I have a question. I was there that day when John Carlos came and spoke, and I have his book, and everybody should have it and read it. It's a I knew about this story, but I didn't know the depth of what they went through. Is It's my understanding that they also stripped them of their medals. It's the it's gold and silver. Is that true? You know, that that kind of got out there, but it's not true. And John Carlos said it this way. He said he would go places and people would say, did they ever give you your medals back? And he said, no, they never took our medals. And he said, they can come to Harlem and get them, but I wouldn't advise it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then also the young man, um, a lot of people don't know this story, if you didn't know the story at all, but the, the young, the young white uh, runner who stood on the podium with them uh, wore a patch or something uh, to support them. And he got death threats and, and such, if I'm not mistaken, is that true? Uh, yeah, he faced a, a, a lot of opposition. He, he, he was Australian and, um, he died, um, I don't know, roughly a decade ago. Peter was, uh, was you know, he paid a price for, for just uh, identifying with Tommy and John. You will pay a price for identifying with the story of Blackness. Yeah. You know, Pastor Moore, the book you gave me, uh, The Greatest by Muhammad Ali, he talks about his Olympic medal and how he threw it in the river because he realized it symbolized nothing. And so for them to do this just a few years later, you know, it, I'm grateful to learn history because it is sad. It's sad to see the backlash because these people were very forward thinking. And, you know, luckily enough today, if we can own our stuff, that recovery of a nation that I talked about a long time ago, making amends is by owning what we've done because you can't heal if you don't own it. Uh, I'm glad you brought that book up again, Clint, because that, you know, some, some of you know, I've been recommending um, a book the past few weeks, and that's the one I had on my list to go next. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? It, it strikes me that the church of all institutions knows in its bones that forgiveness first requires repentance. 
And that obviously repentance requires acknowledgement and knowledge of the wrongs that have been done. And so there is no forgiveness until there is repentance. And we can't find wholeness until we've embraced that. So true, Roy. It's, it's you know, this is a, an issue. Um, some of us were talking, a few of us were talking last night. Um, how, um, who was it, Matt, that, that called whiteness um, a mental health issue? I can't remember. Matt, you still yeah, there? Jen S. Kim. Oh, who was that? Jen Kim. Yeah, Jen S. Kim, whom we have hosted here before. Um, and um, I wonder if it's more, more, if it goes farther in the church, because church is the place where we claim to love unconditionally and and love everybody but how can you love everybody when when you know you're you're separating yourself from the secrets the reality Somebody ask a question. I could really, I could go on about the 68 Olympics and Tommy and John. There's so much there, um, but Jacob? Um, as a white person, I think what we don't want to face or history is we don't know when it's going to end. Like, I was at a meeting yesterday with someone and she kept bringing up stuff that happened and said to Bobo six months ago that was already decided and she kept trying to be fight those battles and I think as white people we were like conditioned to be like can we just move on and I know as a man as a white man with us good I'm often to very like when I get when we get into conversation that on not cut and dry, and we get scared. And so I think a lot of white people are like, just tell us what we need to do to make it better so you don't talk about it again. And from my studies, I read that approach won't ever work, and we're going to have to keep having these discussions, even if we paid every African American family ten million dollars, we could keep having these this gushing and I think that those this gushing scale us because we don't know when it go to end. Wow, well, that's pretty profound. I saw you nodding your head, Clint. What it's what does that say to you? It is fear. It's fear, you know, like when you've done something bad, okay, as a kid, you do something bad at the house, okay, you don't want to fess up because fessing up, you don't know when you're going to hear the end of it. You might be on a timeout for a little while, but you know, three years later down the road, you remember that time when you did this? Well, you know what? Guess what? There's consequences behind actions. And, and the truth is those conversations, which they're delicate. And they, they feel delicate. It, it goes back to what you're saying. It's shame. And, and it manifests itself in and there's fear. And fear normally manifests itself in anger. How do we hide fear? We try to act powerful. We try to act 
you know, we say like, oh, well, that is not that big deal. Let it go. Let it go. You know what I mean? And really, it's because we're trying to we're in fear of having to actually look at it and realize that things aren't as we like them to be. It's disturbing as a white person. I'm gonna tell you this. I didn't grow up. I grew up in a very mixed household, and I, I you know me, I'm a, I'm a very, every, I love everybody. But I've told you this. With Trump, it exposed a lot of white people that aren't that way, and they just assume that other white people are the same way. I've grown my hair. I don't know if you've noticed this, Pastor Moore, but I don't go bald no more. And you know why? Because I don't want that invitation. I do it bald because I'm going thinning hair, not because I'm some sort of a Nazi. But people don't know that. They, they see the outside image and they assume, oh, you're a sympathizer or you're, you know what I mean? And they'll start conversations that are really uncomfortable. And, you know, it, I don't know if you remember Eddie Murphy and the undercover. Remember when he did, it was on Saturday Live and he did as a white person and he said, I'm, and, and he did the makeup like a white person. And he said, I want to see what it's like to be white. And he, and he said, and it was just like a real com comedy, but it's the truth. You go out there into the world and, you know, it's all good. You see everybody interacting together, but then you take away any color from there and then you'll see the true colors come out in some people. And that's disturbing. You know, interestingly, Clint, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we don't know our history. We, we don't know our history, but we do know what's going on. And you reminded me of a woman that... Um, who grew up in a very white supremacist household and someone was, someone asked her, um, you know, what, you know, maybe your parents just, you know, didn't know. And she said, Oh, they knew. And she said, she said, all these white people who are pretending like they don't know what's going on. They know they just don't want to, as Jacob was saying, <laughs> you know, and as you were saying, they just don't, you know, they just don't want to face up to it. Yeah. White fragility. And and I just want to put my two cents in because like you, Clint, you know, if you know my family, I, I come from a mixed family. I also have nieces and nephews and cousins that are people of color. And so of course my view, but my, my parents, they're they're from uh, Oklahoma and Texas and Tennessee and um, thank God they moved out West because I was the youngest of seven and I was not born, you know, my, my older siblings went through Jim Crow and all of that stuff being in Oklahoma. And I, I think what, what upsets me the most is when I talk about white privilege and <clears throat> some of the white folks that I talk about that with are, got, are going, well, I grew up poor. I didn't have any privilege. And I said, you're, you're missing, you're missing the point. Because when you're walking down the street, nobody knows how much money you have or what you're doing. You're still a white person and you're not going to get pulled over at the same rate. You're not going to get questioned at the same rate. You're not going to get followed around in the grocery store at the same rate. You're not going to be denied a, a, a loan at the same rate. So please, let's let's not go there. You're privileged because of the color of your skin. And I'm not saying that to say that you're a bad person. I'm saying this is the reality of who you are. And you need to understand that when you're walking with your black brothers and sisters, they're going to they're going to target all of you because you're in that group. You know, and you need to understand that. And please don't tell me that you don't see color. There's the other group. You know, I just don't see color. So I had to put my girl in check. I said, you know what? If you don't see people's color, you don't see them. Don't whitewash that whole thing. Just go, you know, I just really don't see color. I, I have friends of, of color. No, see them, see them see them of course okay. if nobody sees us there'll never be any reparations right yeah absolutely you know here's the thing about reparations it's more of a moral thing that's gonna that would be good for everybody and yeah. as you know there are plenty of white people who would be enthusiastic if there was some kind of program to uh, level the playing field right something I you are on this call right now, be enthusiastic about seeing something change in that way so that, you know, still right now, uh, you know, there's a tremendous wealth gap and so many people in prison. Diane and I, we talk frequently about how many black and brown people are in prison 
for um, for use or sales of <laughs> cannabis. So there and they're getting poorer. And now that it's legalized, mostly white people in charge of the uh, business, they're they're becoming millionaires. And I mean, if if that doesn't wake anybody up, what will? Incarceration profit. Yeah. Yeah. I see you're on mic, David. Were you going to say something? Um, yeah, that was sort of uh, um, psychic because I, I didn't consciously uh, unmute myself. Um, however, when you brought up reparations, what occurred to me was that uh, my late wife's uh, uh, was Japanese American and, and um, the a generation before her were all caught up in the internment of the Japanese Americans. And Ronald Reagan, of all people, uh, gave them reparations. He sent them a formal apology and a check for $20,000. My father-in-law considered it an insult uh, because he had suffered so mightily. He um, uh, was about to go to Caltech on a scholarship and he lost that scholarship and of course never went to Caltech. Uh, he had a successful career anyway, but in, uh, in any case, that that there is that precedent. It was done for the Japanese Americans who spent a few years from 1942. Uh, many of them, including my father-in-law, got out of the concentration camp by signing a, a loyalty pledge and joining the army. Uh, in fact, uh, the most decorated unit in the war was the 442nd. Uh, who fought in uh, southern France in the Second World War and were used as cannon fodder and they had ex exceedingly high casualty rates. So, but the point is that they were uh, incarcerated for, uh, some of them for the duration of the war, uh, particularly women uh, and, and younger folks who couldn't uh, join the war effort. Uh, so for those two or three years, uh, they, they got compensation and yet for uh, centuries of Slavery, no compensation. And in fact, uh, the discussion doesn't seem to go very far and is often, I, th I think, uh, I mean, I'm no expert on the subject, but I think it's, 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 it's often considered to be kind of a fringe and uh, uh, you know, out there concept. David, I, I was Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I was just wondering, your, your, uh, your dear late wife, Marianne, um, being, you know, having being Japanese, having Japanese parents uh, in internment. Um, if I'm not mistaken, her parents were Methodist, right? Correct. That, so, you know, it's interesting that there were people that found some appeal in church, but after that, they didn't. I mean, Marianne wasn't even born yet; she wouldn't go to church, right? Yeah, well, I think uh, I, my interpretation, uh, and it's just that because I, the truth is I never really discussed it with him, but my sense was that uh, many of the Japanese Americans converted to Methodism as an attempt to assimilate. Yes, and yes. When the, that, that uh, ended in the concentration camps, I think, uh, although uh i think most of them did not uh reject for in any formal way re reject the 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 methodism or the uh, methodist face I, I think they probably really did lose uh, uh lose it lose allegiance to it, lose faith in it and lose allegiance to it and i would argue if not why not yeah well <laughs> Well, thanks for that. I, I, you know, I just wanted to touch on one of the things that uh, Jacob mentioned and, uh, and Clint followed up on um, the fear, um, the fear possibly of retribution or retaliation, that kind of thing. You know, m everything I know about being part of the black world is that we wouldn't wish this on our worst enemy. 
we would not, you know, the wealth inequality, you know, the police killings on and on and on. We, <laughs> it's just not a goal. It's not an objective of uh, Africans in America to, to, to issue some kind of payback. You know, I, I think of the scripture in, in um, Exodus where when the, those slaves from in Egypt escaped and um, the word from Moses, from God was, you know, don't treat, don't treat people like you were treated. Always remember, right? He says, always remember that you were captives in Egypt. And I think that kind of pervades the way many of us think now as African-Americans. This is why we talk about it. Re remember where you came from and hope that it never happens to anybody. I have a quick question. Do we know why um, Black History Month was chosen for February? Anybody? Um, it's related to Lincoln freeing the slaves. Oh, is that what it is? Because some folks are like, oh, why black folks got to get the shortest month of the year? That's <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know, man. I'm going to ask. <laughs> that's mostly done. That's what mostly said tongue in cheek because, you know, it started know. out as, as uh, Carter Woodson, uh, a scholar and historian, uh, started Black History Week, um, which eventually became Black History Month. But he did, yes. Uh, um, as Barbie was saying, he started around uh, Lincoln's birthday back Black History Week. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're right. It's been a joke, but I just thought, you know, let me think about this first. <laughs> Man. <sighs> well, we're getting a little later, but I see um, Christopher. Is that Christopher on there? Yeah. Um, I, I don't, we don't have to spend a long time, uh, uh, correcting my ignorance here, but, um, is there, so as we talk about reparations, I must admit, I don't really know what is the proposal if you, and, and that's oversimplified obviously, but what, who is kind of leading that? What would be the proposal? You know, can each you just, or sorry, not can each just, thinking about the Japanese internment. Uh, David a minute ago talked about his wife and his uh, father-in-law and how he was offended by the $20,000 check. And I just wonder what, who's kind of leading that movement and what would be desired out of reparations? And, and I'm sure that's a long conversation and maybe that could be a Thursday night or maybe I already missed that, but maybe are there any uh, uh, resources I could be directed to to get myself a baseline understanding? Um, I'm gonna, Thanks for that question. And I'm going to ask Jacob and Matt to arrange for one of our Thursdays to explore that. Um, you know, there are multiple voices, uh, you know, maybe the best known right now is Ta-Nehisi Coates, because he's written about it a lot. But uh, yeah, you're right. That's, that's a huge conversation. And <laughs> You know, again, this is about facing family secrets. And I think that maybe the, that in, in many cases, churches are the stronghold for keeping us from, from moving forward. Um, True. You know, after, after George Floyd was murdered, uh, uh, you know, several churches and a denominational office you know, asked, asked me to, you know, it was over Zoom, but asked me to talk to their folks. I, I didn't accept all of the invitations, but, you know, they approached me thinking that they, uh, I remember specifically, our churches could have a relationship. Um, our, our churches could, could um, you know, have a future together. And then they asked me what, for recommendations, what they wow. could do. And, you know, I had some things to say, but one of the things that I found that kind of canceled the relationship was I said, stop reading books by white male authors. You've been doing that your whole life. You're so far behind. And so 
read other books. And that was like a, that was a deal breaker um, for, for churches. Think about that. And so they, what I'm saying is that they didn't, they didn't call back. And th it was their idea, right? It was their idea to, to get something going. But, you know, this happens so much, you know, white America, particularly white Christians, I think, they want reconciliation. Don't want to deal with their shit. Hey, you know, call it out now. Um, I want to recommend something. This uh, Some of you may have seen it. I don't know. But there's actually a really, really um, interesting show called All American. I don't know if you've seen it. It was on the CW. It is uh, the first two seasons are on Netflix. And it it's based on a true story about this um, uh, black athlete football player who's in, in Compton and he makes it to Beverly Hills. I won't tell you the whole story. And it, they, do, they do a pretty darn good job of what young people are going through right now and differences between African-Americans that are growing up in Beverly Hills versus the ones that are growing up and just how, how um, uh, athleticism and that and that sort of thing kind of crosses those lines but do they really and and they really are conscious about you know looking at the different cultures and and how there's mixes and uh, basically a lot of what what young young people of this generation are are thinking even though it's it's you know it's washed a little bit but it's still something that I would recommend um, even in this in the hallways of the of the Crenshaw you can see um, a painting of John Carlos and Tommy Smith doing their their salute. So they put that in there. They're they're putting things in there, um, and it's just a, a beautiful um, way of looking at how art and athleticism can cross all those lines if we allow it to. And I'm not. Gonna, I'm going to ask you to put put it in chat so that okay. everybody has a record of it. And uh, is there anybody who hasn't weighed in to with a comment or a question who would like to? I'll just add, um, you know, we talked, we are talking about the history of uh, America, this, uh, this country's context, but, uh, you know, Sayuri has been uh, sharing with me a lot about um, the fact that the more uh, she learns about Japan and its history. Uh, she's, she is now understanding this country's history because it's happening the same way in Japan as well. Um, consciousness are uh, being renewed and people are asking these hard questions. What is the, what is the history of Japan, uh, the people, uh, how the indigenous peoples like Ainu, um, caste systems that have placed uh, people groups like Buraku, who are looked at as truly second, third class citizens, uh, their relationship to Okinawans, their relationship to, to uh, Korea. Uh, Korea was co uh, known as Chosan uh, before they split, and then to East Southeast Asia and you know, to China, all these things are starting to get dug up. And um, of course, just like this country, there are uh, people in the right wing, if you will, that are trying to whitewash, that are trying to um, skip over that and trying to you know, protect Japanese nationalism. And so it's very interesting. And I, I, I have been really thinking about the passage in Joel about in, you know, God uh, prophesied through Joel in the last days, how, you know, that, that, that the spirit, that divine spirit will be poured out. And I think this is the, the, the movement or the energy or this love or the creativity of the purity of God's spirit that has been poured out that causes humanity. I know that we look at it very narrowly uh, through the lens of Pentecostalism, but I think we miss the point if we just stick to that only, because I, when we look at all this and now through generations, I think there is a renewal of consciousness, reawakening and here in America, in Canada, South Africa, in East Asia, all over the place where, where now 
uh, um, there's the asking of what what is what is truth? What has been happening? And then you know the the, the movement towards justice and righteousness and 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 steps towards reparations. Uh, that's what I see globally, and and that's what I hold on to uh, as as hope um, um, and to know that there is a, the this generations that is coming up that 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 is wanting nothing less than than what is just and what is right. So that's what I wanted to uh, uh, share. Wasn't it Sayuri who said, who, I think it's Sayuri who said that the Japanese people are the white people of Asia? Yeah, I think she did. Wow. Yeah. So it's very interesting if you look at it globally. Yeah. Well, my friends, it's time for a communion and we want to be a communion. We want to, you know, have hearts that are safe with one another and, and healing for one another. And I, I believe that's what we are and what we are becoming. Um, so we, we embrace the, the love of God and as Kanichi was saying, the Holy Spirit, the spirit that moves throughout the earth, reminding of us of our true selves and our possibilities. May, may those of us right here, right now, as we are gathered, experience the help of the spirit, the uplift of the spirit that frees us from shame, from captivity to secrets, release us into our full humanity. We honor you, Jesus, as an example of that. And just like so many people who lived against the culture of zero-sum gameness, you paid the price for it. I thank you that there are people in the world who are willing to pay the price. I, I thank you for the folks that I know, not just white folks, but, but uh, the, the, 